The contents and proposals of both the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and Paris Peace Conference 1919, which later concluded with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, were the subject of intensive discussion by both Zionist and Arab delegations. And the process of the negotiations are widely reported in both communities. In particular, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire led to an undertaking by the victorious powers, predominantly Great Britain and France, to assume a holy mission of civilization in the power vacuum of the Middle East. Under the Balfour Declaration, a homeland for the Jewish people was to be created in Palestine. These post-World War I arrangements both for Palestine and other Arab societies led to a radicalization of the Arab world. On March 1, 1920, the death of Joseph Trumpelder in the Battle of Tel Hai at the hands of a Shiite group from southern Lebanon, and the fact that Jewish settlements Mechula, Ayelet Hashakar, Dgani Abet, and Menachemia are attacked by Arabs. As well as that the Benei Yehuda settlement is wiped out of the map after the only family that lived there were murdered by an Arab. All this caused deep concern among Jewish leaders who made numerous requests to the OETA administration to address the issue of security and forbid a pro-Syrian public rally. However, their fears were largely discounted by the Chief Administrative Officer General Louis Bowles, Military Governor Ronald Storrs and General Edmund Allenby, despite a warning from the head of the Zionist Commission Heim Weizmann that a pogrom is in the air, supported by assessments available to Storrs. Communiques had been issued about foreseeable troubles among Arabs, and between Arabs and Jews. To Weizmann and the Jewish leadership, these developments were reminiscent of instructions that Russian generals had issued on the eve of pogroms. In the meantime, local Arab expectations had been raised to a pitch by the declaration of the Syrian Congress on March 7 of the independence of Greater Syria in the Kingdom of Syria. With Faisal as its king, that included the British-controlled territory within its claimed domain. On 7 and March 8, demonstrations took place in all cities of Palestine, shops were closed and many Jews were attacked. Attackers carried slogans such as, Death to Jews, or, Palestine is our land and the Jews are our dogs. Jewish leaders requested that OETA authorize the arming of the Jewish defenders to make up for the lack of adequate British troops. Although this request was declined, Zayev Jabotinsky, together with Pinhas Ruttenberg, led an effort to openly train Jewish volunteers in self defense, an effort of which the Zionist Commission kept the British informed. Many of the volunteers were members of the Maccabi Sports Club and some of them were veterans of the Jewish Legion. Their month of training largely consisted of calisthenics and hand to hand combat with sticks. By the end of March, about 600 were said to be performing military drills daily in Jerusalem. Jabotinsky and Ruttenberg also began organizing the collection of arms. The Nebi Musa festival is an annual spring Muslim festival that began on the Friday before Good Friday and included a procession to the Nebi Musa shrine, Tomb of Moses, near Jericho. It had apparently existed since the 12th century. Arab educator and essayist Khalil al sakakini described how tribes and caravans would come with banners and weapons. The Ottoman Turks usually deployed thousands of soldiers and even artillery to keep order in the narrow streets of Jerusalem during the Nebi Musa procession. However, stores issued a warning to Arab leaders, but deployed only 188 policemen. In 1920 the celebration of Nebi Musa began at the 4th of April, parallel to Passover and the Christian Orthodox Easter Day. Amin al-Husseini and Arif al-Arif excited the Arab people with hate speeches against the Jews. After the traditional prayer in the end of the holiday, a crowd of incited Arab celebrants marched from the mosque in the Judean desert, 20 kilometers from Jerusalem, to the Jewish houses in the old city of Jerusalem chanting, slaughter the Jews, and, the government is with us. By 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, 4 April 1920, 60,000 to 70,000 Arabs had congregated in the city square for the Nebi Musa festival, and groups had been attacking Jews in the old city's alleys for over an hour.
A speech marked by anti-Zionist rhetoric was delivered by Amin al-Husseini from the balcony of the Arab club. Musa al-Husseini, his uncle, the mayor, was also with him and spoke from the municipal building's balcony in similar terms. According however to testimony given by Fayyad al-Bakri to the Palin Commission, the rioting began when the Hebron banner he was holding while standing in Jaffa Street outside the Credit Lyonnais Bank was spat on by a Jew and when the latter was pushed away, Jewish bystanders began throwing stones. The editor of the newspaper Syria al Janubia, southern Syria, Arif al-Arif, another Arab club member, delivered a speech on horseback at the Jaffa Gate. The nature of his speech is disputed. According to Benny Morris, he said, if we don't use force against the Zionists and against the Jews, we will never be rid of them, while Bernard Wasserstein wrote, he seems to have cooperated with the police, and there is no evidence that he actively instigated violence. In fact, Wasserstein adds, Zionist intelligence reports of this period are unanimous in stressing that he spoke repeatedly against violence. The crowd chanted, We will drink Jewish blood, both Muslims and Christians participated, on one banner it was written, Will we betray our land for the murderers of Jesus? The crowd also chanted, Independence, independence. And sung, Palestine is our country, and the Jews are our dogs. Arab police joined in applause, and violence started. The local Arab population ransacked the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. The Torah Haim Yeshiva was raided, and Torah scrolls were torn and thrown on the floor, and the building then set alight. During the next three hours, 160 Jews were injured. Khalil al sakakini witnessed the eruption of violence in the old city. A riot broke out, the people began to run about and stones were thrown at the Jews. The shops were closed, and there were screams. I saw a Zionist soldier, covered in dust and blood. Afterwards, I saw one Hebronite approach a Jewish shoeshine boy, who hid behind a sack in one of the walls, comers next to Jaffa Gate, and take his box, and beat him over the head. He screamed and began to run, his head bleeding, and the Hebronite left him and returned to the procession. The riot reached its zenith. All shouted, Muhammad's religion was born with the sword. I immediately walked to the municipal garden. My soul is nauseated and depressed by the madness of humankind. British military units, that were in the Jewish settlement Daz, that hoped the British will protect them, left the city a few days before. Arab policemen often joined the rioters. A British military pilot who crashed into the scene, tried to stop the crowd and was beaten to death. The procession returned from Jaffa Street to the Old City, where pilgrims stormed Jewish shops and Jewish passers-by with batons, knives and stones. The Arab policemen from the unit in charge of the Old City did not help and some of them joined the rioters. The local self-defense organization, the Haganah, sent two squads equipped with wooden and metal batons to the Old City. But British soldiers blocked their way. The British sent units of Indian soldiers to defend the Jewish quarter, but this was done too late and that night the military governor stores ordered the Indian unit to leave the old city. The army imposed night curfew on Sunday night and arrested several dozen rioters, but on Monday morning they were allowed to attend morning prayers and were then released. Arabs continued to attack Jews and break into their homes, especially in Arab-majority mixed buildings. On Monday, April 5, as disturbances grew worse, the old city was sealed off by the army and no one was allowed to exit the area. Martial law was declared, but looting, burglary, rape, and murder continued. Several homes were set on fire, and tombstones were shattered. British soldiers found that the majority of illicit weapons were concealed on the bodies of Arab women. On Monday evening, the soldiers were evacuated from the old city, a step described in the Palin report as an error of judgment. Even with martial law, it took the British authorities another four days to restore order. On the morning of the third day, April 6, thugs attacked the yard of Hannah Yaffa, near the Gate of Sin, of the Temple Mount, in the Muslim quarter, where three Jewish families lived, who had been under siege since the beginning of the riots. 
The attackers broke down the courtyard doors, and the tenants fled to the top floor. The rioters broke the furniture and looted the house and then went up to the second floor and beat the tenants, including the children. Moshe Lifshitz was hit in the head with an iron bar and seriously injured. Then the attackers raped both of his sisters. One is 25 years old and the other is 15 years old. On April 8, the British army ordered the celebrants of Nabi Musa not to pass through the old city on their way back, and peace was maintained. The Haganah managed to evacuate about 300 Jews from the old city who lived in isolated houses outside the Jewish quarter. Although the Jews predicted the riots, and Zayev Jabotinsky even organized a group of fighters ahead of time, the little that was prepared was not enough. Five Jews, residents of the old city, were killed in the riots, and about 200 were injured. Two other Jews later died of their wounds, including Rabbi Mordecai Tversky, the Rebbe of Ramastrivka. Women captured by the rioters were raped, much property was looted and synagogues burned. The defense was with them. They were accused of causing riots by planting in the crowd and trying to steal the flags of the pilgrims. The historian Joseph Klausner wrote in those days in the Haaretz newspaper. Among the dead and wounded are Jews from all denominations, from all classes, from all parties, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, Yemenis and Persians, laborers and merchants, devout and free educated rabbis. The enemy did not differentiate between them. Please stop distinguishing between us. Then the enemy will get the opposite of what he asked for. In Hebrew the incidents were described as mirayat, connoting targeted attacks reminiscent of what had often occurred especially in Russia, whereas Palestinian Arabs referred to them as an heroic witness to an Arab revolt. The use of the word pogrom to describe such outbreaks of communal violence bore with it the implication that the governing authorities, in this case the British administration, had actively connived in an anti-Jewish riot. The term drew an analogy between the classic form such actions took in Eastern Europe, where Jews were the victims of racist, anti-Semitic terror campaigns supported by the ruling authorities. It was asserted soon after, by Heim Weizmann and British Army Lieutenant Colonel Richard Meinertshagen. That Hajj Amin al-Husseini had been put up to inciting the riot by British Field Marshal Allenby's Chief of Staff, Colonel Bertie Harry Waters Taylor, to demonstrate to the world that Arabs would not tolerate a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The assertion was never proven, and Meinertshagen was dismissed. The Zionist Commission noted that before the riots Arab milkmen started to demand their customers in Mia Sherim pay them on the spot, explaining that they would no longer be serving the Jewish neighborhood. Christian storekeepers had marked their shops in advance with the sign of the cross so that they would not be mistakenly looted. A previous commission report also accused stores of inciting the Arabs, blaming him for sabotaging attempts to purchase the Western Wall as well. A petition circulated among American citizens and presented to their consul protested that the British had prevented Jews from defending themselves. After the violence broke out, Zayev Jabotinsky met military governor stores and suggested deployment of his volunteers, but his request was rejected. Stores confiscated his pistol and demanded to know the location of his other weapons, threatening to arrest him for possessing a firearm. Later, Stores changed his mind and asked for 200 volunteers to report to the police headquarters to be sworn in as deputies. After they arrived and the administering of the oath had begun, orders came to cease and he sent them away. Arab volunteers had also been invited, and were likewise sent away. On Sunday night, the first day of the riots, several dozen rioters were arrested, but on Monday morning they were allowed to attend morning prayers and were then released. On Monday evening, after martial law was declared, the soldiers were evacuated from the old city, a step described in the Palin report as an error of judgment. After the riots, stores visited Munekim Usishkin, the new head of the Zionist Commission, to express regrets for the tragedy that has befallen us. Usishkin asked, What tragedy? I mean the unfortunate events that have occurred here in the recent days, stores said. His Excellency means the pogrom, 
suggested Usishkin. When Storrs hesitated to categorize the events as such, Usishkin replied, You colonel, are an expert on matters of management and I am an expert on the rules of pogroms. The Palin report noted that Jewish representatives persisted in describing the events as a pogrom, implying that the British administration had connived in the violence. Many months later, the report of the British Commission of Inquiry into Palin was written. The members of the Commission of Inquiry are two generals, a colonel and a legal adviser, and 152 witnesses appeared before them. The Commission of Inquiry was given various testimonies as to what ignited the riots. Many testified about Arabs attacking an old Jew at the entrance to the Amdursky Hotel. They hit him in the head with sticks. Someone tried to help him and was stabbed with a knife. The report states, all the evidence shows that these attacks were of a cowardly and treacherous nature. Most were against the elderly, women and children, the majority were wounded in the back of the neck. One of the witnesses who testified before the committee was Colonel Richard Maynersgen, who had served since September 1919 as the chief political officer of the military administration. He claimed that during the riots the British bureaucracy sided with the Arabs. He even accused bulls and other officers of causing disturbances. In his diary he wrote, I find myself alone here, among the non-Jews, in my support of the Jews. He was dismissed some time later. The report supported the Jewish claims about the Arabs' responsibility for the riots and even accused the British of conspiring with the Arabs. The committee concluded that Governor Storrs had failed due to excessive self-confidence that the police would be able to maintain order at the Nabi Musa celebrations, as it did in the demonstrations that preceded the celebrations. The committee found that the security forces were not properly prepared and that the main victims were the Jews. On the other hand, they stated that all the trouble began with the publication of the Balfour Declaration and estimated that the Zionist movement came out of the control of the moderate Chaim Weizmann and came under the control of extremists. They described Zionism as a nationalist and dictatorial movement, intending to expel the Arabs from the country, and therefore came to the conclusion that there was reason for the Arabs' fears. The members of the committee also wrote quite a few absurd things, they conducted a historical review, in which they noted that Jewish sovereignty in the ancient land of Israel lasted only 300 years. They wrote that Bolshevism flows in the heart of the Zionist movement and that many of the Jews who immigrate to Palestine bring with them Bolshevik views. One such is Lieutenant Jabotinsky, who is said to have founded a Bolshevik club called Poalii Zion, they noted that the witnesses who appeared before the committee spoke eight languages, including Yiddish and Jargon, without knowing that Jargon is a nickname for Yiddish. The Flynn Report was never published. It was signed in July 1920, but by then the military administration had already been replaced by the civilian administration. From the moment the riots broke out, the British government stopped Jewish immigration to Palestine. On July 1, Herbert Samuel began his role as High Commissioner and immediately released all Jewish activists arrested during the riots and opened the gates of the country to Jewish aliyah. On July 8, a general amnesty was declared and all the Arabs convicted of disturbances were released. Amin al-Husseini and Araf al-Araf, who fled the country, were allowed to return and soon served in public positions and received government salaries. Al-Husseini's image as a hero of the events made him a national symbol in the eyes of the Palestinians. He received much sympathy, as these riots were perceived in the minds of the Arabs of Palestine as a defiance against British rule. Over 200 people were put on trial as a result of the riots, including 39 Jews. Musa Qasim al husseini was replaced as mayor by the head of the rival Nashashibi clan, Ragab Bey Nashashibi. Amin al husseini and Arif al arif were arrested for incitement, but when they were let out on bail they both escaped to Syria. In another version, al arif was warned and escaped before being arrested. In their absence, a military court sentenced them to ten years imprisonment. 
The Arab riots were publicly protested by sheikhs from 82 villages in the Jerusalem and Jaffa areas who issued a formal statement saying that, in their view, Zionist settlement was not a danger to their communities. Similar declarations would be repeated in cablegrams sent to London in 1922, as hundreds of sheikhs and mukhtars lent their authority and support to Jewish immigration. The tenor of these positions was that such immigration would, as the Zionist movement itself affirmed, improve the lives of Arabs as industrial development progressed. The sheikhs protesting the riots, and telegramming later the British colonial secretary to express solidarity with the Zionist program were sometimes bribed to state this position by the World Zionist Organization. Their opinions were procured. British soldiers were sent to search Jews for arms at the demand of the Palestinian Arab leadership. They searched the offices and apartments of Haim Weizmann, the head of the Zionist Commission, and Jabotinsky. At Jabotinsky's house, they found three rifles, two pistols, and 250 rounds of ammunition. Nineteen men were arrested, but not Jabotinsky, who went to the jail of his own volition to insist on his arrest. A military judge released him because he had not been home when the guns were discovered, but he was again arrested a few hours later. Jabotinsky was convicted of possessing the pistol that Storrs had confiscated on the riot's first day, among other things. The primary witness was none other than Ronald Storrs, who said he did not remember being told about the self-defense organization. He was sentenced to 15 years' imprisonment and sent to Egypt, though the next day he was returned to Acre Prison. Jabotinsky's trial and sentencing created an uproar, and were protested by London press including the Times and questioned in the British Parliament. Even before the editorials appeared, the commander of British forces in Palestine and Egypt, General Congreve, wrote Field Marshal Wilson that Jews were sentenced far more severely than Arabs who had committed worse offences. He reduced Jabotinsky's sentence to a year, and that of the other 19 Jews arrested with him to six months. The new civilian government under Herbert Samuel granted a general amnesty in early 1921. However, Amin al-Husayni and Arif al-Arif were excluded from the amnesty because they had fled before their convictions had been passed down. Samuel pardoned Amin in March 1921 and appointed him Mufti of Jerusalem. When the Supreme Muslim Council was created in the following year, Husseini demanded and received the title Grand Mufti, a position which came with life tenure. Also, General Storrs became the civil governor of Jerusalem under the new administration. As the riots began, Jewish immigration to Palestine was temporarily halted by the British. Also, feeling that the British were unwilling to defend Jewish settlements from continuous Arab attacks. Palestinian Jews set up self-defense units, which came to be called the Haganah, defense. Furthermore, the riots increased the feeling of Palestinian nationalism within the Palestinian Arab community.